Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 239 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today's episode of the show is sponsored by Dancing for Diabetes, Omnipod, and Dexcom. You can go to dancing the number four diabetes.com, myomnipod.com forward slash juicebox, or dexcom.com forward slash juicebox to find out more about the sponsors. If you have trouble remembering those links, don't worry. They're available at juiceboxpodcast.com. Or if you're listening in a podcast app, they're right there in the show notes. Just tap on it. Only about 10 days ago, Kevin Sayer, the CEO of Dexcom, was on the show, kind of sharing the big picture of where the company was going over the next year or so. And of course, as always, I reached out to you all and asked if you had questions for Kevin, which you all did, and I really appreciate. So many of you asked really fantastic questions on my Bold with Insulin Facebook page, and actually on the Instagram page for the podcast as well, that we had just a repository of great feedback for Dexcom. So I asked Jake Leach to come on. Jake, of course, is the chief technology officer at Dexcom because he's in charge of scientific research, engineering, product development, product management. Like he's the big overseer of this technology. And I thought, how great would it be if I could funnel your feedback right into his notebook? And that is exactly what Jake and I have done here over the hour that you're about to listen to. So if you want to hear your questions and other people's questions asked of Jake, if you'd like to hear the suggestions going right into his notebook, literally you'll hear him writing in his notebook, then you're going to love this. And along the way, Jake's going to share things that are coming. Jake's going to explain the Apple Watch launch, what no data means, and much more. Okay, are we all ready to find out what Dexcom is going to be offering us over the next year or so? Hmm? Are you getting excited? Are you jacked up? Are you ready to believe that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise? And to always consult a physician before making any changes to your medical plan or becoming bold with insulin? If you are ready for those things, then I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jake Leach. Hello, it's Jake. Jake, it's Scott Benner. Hey, Scott, how you doing, man? Good. Listen, hey, right off the bat, I got to say, first of all, we're recording, but I need to tell you, uh, Kevin doesn't answer his own phone anymore, so I don't know what you need to do with your next contract negotiation or something like that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, I, I was ex- I was expecting your call, so I, I knew it was probably you, but I, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't always answer my own phone either, only when I know I've got someone calling me. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't know if he was saying he's just making a power move on you there or something like that. Exactly. That's funny. Jake, I have to tell you, I had a call set up with Kevin that was kind of wrapped around ADA, and then I had a problem on my end. I couldn't do it. And it actually gave me a little more time to reach out into the community of people who listen to the podcast and ask if they had questions for Kevin. And they did, but then they asked a lot of other questions that seemed more uh, leech centric, let's call them, I guess. Awesome. We're going to have to come up with a different word because I can't just keep saying Jake's back on the podcast again. We're going to have to find different ways to say it. But I was wondering if we couldn't treat this time together as sort of, um, I don't know, like a feedback thing for you instead of... That'd like, be great. Yeah. Can we do that? Or that? That'd be really cool. Yeah. Let's do it. Now that I have your attention, let me just say this very briefly. And then Jake and I will, in fact, get into the podcast proper. Here are these words that I want you to remember. Dancing for Diabetes. That's dancing the number four diabetes.com. Check out their blog. Check them out on Facebook. See what they're doing on Instagram. Dancing the number four diabetes.com. I'm going to just start with some questions I have based on stuff they asked. So aware time consideration. Like you guys are at 10 days for G6. Uh, G fives and, and if people still have fours, I guess seven days for the older ones, tens for these. Yeah. Yep. How come you? I mean, I'll just ask a farcical question. How come I can't just wear it forever? Like, what stops it from being what it what you need it to be? Yeah. Great. Uh, great question. Yeah. And how do you stretch that out at some point? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So um, uh, we see um, wear time. Uh, so extending the wear time is a great way to add convenience to the product. So you don't have to change it as often. Um, but we also recognize that there are challenges to 
um, continuing to be able to wear the, the device for, for longer periods of time. There are two main um, things that limit the, the wear of the sensor. The first one is, is more obvious, and it's really around the tape the adhesive. Um, uh, with the adhesive, we're always trying to run this balance of um, it sticks well um, to the body and uh, you know allows people to be active and, and do all the things, kids running around, exercise, all those things, without it causing irritation. So there is uh, quite a bit to adhesive technology that goes into it about readability uh, of the adhesive patch um, and the amount of adhesive that's um, uh, on, on the product. And so over time, we've continued to make enhancements to the adhesive um, to make it last longer. Mm-hmm. Um, but even today, we know that not everybody can get, um, you know, not, not everybody's getting 10 days out of all their G6 sensors. And so we've offered, one of the things we've done is we've offered the, an overlay, um, which is another a clear adhesive that, that some people found very helpful. We offer that for free. Um, people can call into our tech support uh, and get that. Uh, we send out a quantity of them uh, that'll last. I can't remember. I think it's 10. I think we send out, but we send out a package of those that, that helps. Um, there's a lot of other folks that have figured out other ways um, to get the uh, sensors to stay adhered to their body. But we do have uh, many active programs. Part of our G7 program is a new patch as, as well as um, uh, our future uh, technologies. We're always looking at patch design and kind of pushing the limits on what's possible. So that's one thing is the adhesive patch. And, and the I want to thing, let me tell you before you jump yeah, into the other thing. I Arden's actually about an hour and fifteen minutes into a Dexcom swap. So we just moved her site to another place. And as we put cleaned her site, put it on, and used your overlay like put it right on immediately when we put just the it, and that's become kind of a common way we do it. We used to not put it on right away and wait till like I don't know, the first time she was like, I'm getting a shower. Like, and, we're, and, and we just realized eventually, like, that's stupid. It's meaningless. So just we put it on. It's been uh, terrific. We were using Opsite FlexiFix before, um, mm-hmm. which you can buy on Amazon for like 20 bucks for like a giant roll that lasts forever and ever. But your overlay is pre-cut and it's easy and it works great. And, you know, it's been fine for us. I, I also kind of want to say... I'm sorry. I know you you had a thought. I hope you're able to hold it for a second. Um, of course, of the, course. The, I was thinking earlier today, like thinking about our conversation, and just I don't. I, I I think sometimes because we need our insulin pump or we need our Dexcom, that we think of them as these. I don't know these things that we just. I don't know. I don't know what the word is exactly, but it should just work all the time, which is expected, and hopefully companies work towards that. But if I was on a heart monitor in the hospital. I wouldn't say to myself, now's the time I'm going to do jumping jacks because my leads would fall off. And like, there's, I think people, <laughs> I, you know what I mean? Like, I think there's, there, there has to be some on me to say to myself, I'm a person wearing an insulin pump. I'm a person wearing a glucose monitor. There are some things that are going to affect it adversely. That's not just, uh, that can't be fixed by us tell, saying to the person that makes it, Hey, why don't you just fix this? Be, right, because like adhesive is a great example. Arden does not get any adverse reactions from wearing adhesive. She could wear your Dexcom for three days, seven days, ten days. I'm not saying I would reset it, but she could wear it for twenty days, and she never has a problem. And other people, and they're absolutely heartbreaking pictures online, have really horrible reactions to them. Um, yeah, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean. Like the, there's the vast. Go ahead. I was just going to say that it's such an individual issue and and we expect it to fit for us all the time except my situation's different than someone else's situation but you're still one company trying to make one product that's right that's uh that's part of the challenge right trying to make um uh, the product work for everybody and i think um you're absolutely right scott there's a um there's a motivation factor about you know uh, it, it takes some effort uh, at different times depending on what what you're doing uh, what the situation is to Ensure that your sensor or your your pump sites uh, are um, you know secure to your body. But um, we we are always trying to you know look at what's the latest technology that we can utilize to uh, make the sensor stay adhered. Um, and your point about is it, one of the points you made earlier was really important. Putting that overlay on at the beginning of a sensor wear, we found in our in our studies where we've we've really looked at the performance of the adhesives. It does matter. Putting it on the first day is the best way to do it. You can put it on later, but putting it on on the first day really helps helps um, keep keep it uh, you know the best longevity 
um, is putting that overlay on the first the first day. Do you have any guesses as to why, or it's just what you're seeing? It's um, basically a lot of when when the adhesive patches start peeling or failing, um, it generally occurs from the outer outside, and it starts peeling on the outside. Mm-hmm. Um, this isn't the case where you like walk into something and actually knock the whole patch off, but if it's just over wear and it's, it'll start peeling from the outer edge. So if you've already got the overlay on, it protects the outer edge of the, the white part of the patch from peeling up. Never peeling up. Um, and so it really, um, just kind of stops that, that, uh, occurrence of the, cool. the patch peeling. And I stopped you earlier from what I assume was talking more about the the hardware and how long it can last in the body. Is that, am I? Yeah. That yeah. The other major driver for um, sensor longevity is the um, performance of the sensor probe. So um, the, the tip of the sensor um, probe that's under the skin is where uh, towards the, the very end of it is where the glucose um, measurement is made. Um, and there is chemistry on there that's um, consumable. Um, and um, one of the things is, uh, that there's a couple of things, there's the, the consumable chemistry itself on the sensor, and that t- tends to not be the limiter because we've, we've designed the sensor to last, um, uh, you know, even in extreme environments, the, the chemistry will survive for up to two weeks. Mm-hmm. But the other thing is that everybody's physiology um, is similar but different, right? So some uh, the way your body reacts with your sensor, it may uh, begin to start... You know, the foreign body response over time, it starts treating it as, okay, it's a biocompatible as possible, but it's still a sensor probe under your skin. And so um, some some people, and towards the later days, um, at, at times we'll see, a, um, you know, sensor failure message, and we, we, kind of, we call that early sensor shutoff. And um, what that is, it's the algorithm inside the transmitter that's always looking at the sensor it starts to determine that the sensor signal is not as expected and so not reliable. Mm-hmm. And if that happens enough times, um, it'll actually shut the sensor off. And so that's the other major factor other than adhesive um, when it comes to it can, will a sensor last the full 10 days is, is about that um, looking at that sensor signal and ensuring it's accurate. Um, there's a number of new algorithms we put into G6 um, related to ensuring we hit those um, special controls uh, for the FDA, um, the ICGM requirements. That's really sh- strict uh, requirements, particularly around outliers where the the system is not accurate. A lot of um, you basically can't have uh, very many of those uh, to meet the standards. So um, we put some algorithms in that look at looks at the sensor signal and shuts it off if not reliable. I'm so incredibly proud of myself right now, which is probably a weird thing to say after you spoke and uh, nobody heard from me. But I, you got to a moment where you paused and I thought, I'm going to ask Jake if that's because of G6 not requiring finger pokes and this stuff that the FDA probably meant. Like, And, I, and you, then you said it. And I was like, oh my God, I'm getting so good at this. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> nice work. <laughs> Thank you. I've, I've managed to pat myself on the back for doing nothing just now. But no, but seriously, that's exactly what I thought was, okay, you guys went to G6, you, you had, you, you said, I want to be able to say you don't need finger sticks to wear and you can use a G6. And that makes sense to me that then the tolerances for what, what the algorithm will allow out of, I guess, tolerance would be smaller then. And that make is, so is that why, and let's just, I'm just going to say it kind of bluntly, is that why some people are getting more no data signals with G6 than they got on G5? Are you ready to see how simple it is to get a free, no obligation demo of the Omnipod sent directly to your house? MyOmnipod.com forward slash juice box. I hit return. It says request a free experience kit. That's a peck, by the way, a pod experience kit. I'm going to type my first name, Scott, my last name, Benner, my zip code, which I won't be telling you. My email address, Ardensday at iCloud.com. Preferred phone number, <laughs> type of diabetes, type 1 in my case. I certify that I'm 18 years of age or older, and I acknowledge I have been provided access to the Insulate Corporation Privacy Policy and HIPAA Privacy, which I have. And then I authorize. Insulate Corporation, its distributors, affiliates, and wholly owned subsidiaries to contact my by telephone. It just means they can call you. And then I click request your experience code. There. It's done. 
Now I'm going to be able to try on and wear the Omnipod for my very self to find out if it is something that I believe I would enjoy before moving forward with it. Come on. You can't, you can't turn that down. They just send it right to your house. And then you figure out what tubeless insulin pumping is all about. You get to say to yourself, hmm, that kid, the guy talks about on the podcast, she's been wearing this for 11 years. I'm going to give it a whirl. MyOmnipod.com forward slash juice box or the links in your show notes or juiceboxpodcast.com. Is that why some people are getting more no data signals with G6 than they got on G5? Yeah, that is part of it, uh, where um, the data displayed has to be um, accurate enough to make decisions. Uh, and so that is part of it. Now, we do have uh, in the pipeline a number of um, enhancements we're working on. Um, now that we've had G6 in the market um, for just about a year, uh, we've got a lot of um, user data um, coming back to us about the performance of the product. And uh, it's one of the things we do is we monitor product performance in the field. And so we're um, working on algorithms that will. Um, more data will be displayed. And so we have a couple of um, updates that will be coming um, that, you know, the kind of users, it'll be, it'll be embedded in, in some of the newer transmitters that will be coming out for G6. And it, it, it should, um, for some users, it, you know, they'll, they'll see less of those, those instances of data um, uh, being uh, um, blanked out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's one enhancement. We're always, we're always looking at how to, how to make things more improved. I guess the other thing I would say, too, is we're, we're really working on how do we ease the burden of sensor replacement. So if someone's sensor, if a user's sensor doesn't last the full 10 days, how do we um, make it easier for them to get a new sensor? I mean, you can imagine there's a lot of things we can do if they're using the, the, the phone app. Um, and so we're really focusing on that because we know that's a, a pain point is if your sensor doesn't last 10 days and you're expecting it to, um, how do you, we make sure that you've always got a sensor um, to, to ba- as a backup in case that one this one doesn't last your full 10 days. So, because you know, not, not all sensors will, will last 10 days for many different reasons, but we talked about the two main ones. Yeah, I have to say, and this is where I hope people listening aren't just like, yeah, Scott's saying that because Dexcom, you know, they buy ads on his podcast. It's not why. Arden never doesn't make it 10 days. It, it, but it could just be randomness in her body makeup that is allowing that to happen. And so... I mean, again, I don't want to say that I extended a sensor recently, but, you know, I saw what other people see 16 or 17 days in. Yeah. Yeah. The spotty, no data stuff. And the minute I saw it, I was like, boom, gone. Like, get rid of it. It's out of here. But interestingly enough, it just does not happen to her in the 10 day window. Most, most people don't have the problem. There's, there are some people that have more of an issue, but um, most of our our customers do, uh, the sensors do last 10 days. Yeah. So you're hoping one day that they'll be able to pop onto an iPhone or Android app and just say, hey, I had a sensor failure. Here's the pertinent information about it. And then another one will come to them? Yeah. Or or the app auto detects it. I mean, we we know. I mean, Uh, the app issues the message so we could auto detect it and auto ship. I mean, that that would be a a really nice enhancement. Jake, that's amazing. Is that like going to happen before I'm old? Her? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's the it's the power of the the mobile platform, right? When you're connected on the phone, yeah. there are so many more things we could provide. I think we're just starting to. Figure it out. I mean, Follow was a really important um, was kind of our main um, update for the you know kind of moving the mobile platform when we did it on the G4 system. Yeah, it, the connectivity allowed us to do the remote monitoring, and there's so much more we we can and will be doing with with the mobile platforms. Um, and uh, we, there will be, uh, I, I do see a day where there will, in, before you're old, Scott, where we, <laughs> we can auto, auto replace uh, sensors if, if, an issue, you know, if an issue occurs. Jake, I fixed a couple of steps outside in my landscaping the other day, and it took seven days for my knees not to hurt. So I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> you know what? You just said something that made me think of a question that's not on my list. I feel like this is the first time I'm seeing you guys say to me, hey, this G6 thing, we're going to update it and improve it. We're not just going to hold these updates and improvements to the next level. Like, you know, like G5 uh, to me came out, it was G5. I'm sure you did some back, you know, enhancements that were maybe on the digital side that I didn't see. But is this the first time you're going to actually make an improvement or a change to the transmitter itself during the, I guess, the life of the product? Well, uh, it's a great question. We did a little bit of that on G5. 
but um, I think one, one of the things that we've done over time is um, you have the development teams, our product development teams, we've staffed, we really had a focus on our new products, but also um, maintaining and enhancing our current products. Um, because we generally have this um, you know, three to four year cycle between major um, iterations. I'm sorry, there's a, a jet flying over uh, the building, a little bit of loud background. Being in San Diego, we're right next to uh, the Marine base in Miramar. Nice. Um, that was an F-18. So, um, yeah, so uh, we, we've really focused on being able to enhance the system while um, being um, working on our new platforms. And one of the things that G5 introduced is with the a lot of the intelligence on and the architecture uh, of the intelligence being on the transmitter, transmitters are replaced every three months. So we really can push it. It has allowed us to push out updates um, uh, faster uh, than in previous years where you kind of had a, a system that was around for longer. Um, and then also with the app updates available, we can really get things out faster. So the architecture of our system allows us um, to uh, make those updates. And then we've also added more staff that their focus is to improve the products we have. Okay. Um, I mean, it's, throw in a comment from a user uh, and then I'm going to move on to something else. So this is a really honest feedback from someone on Instagram who said, I have to be honest, I almost always lie when I call Dexcom tech support and they ask me where I put the sensor. Uh, and and so I have an interesting uh, background because my wife does drug safety. So I understand why you ask why they're wearing it. Uh, but I think people are afraid that if they respond with an answer that's not FDA approved, that you're not going to replace the sensor. And I don't know the answer to this question when I'm asking, but would you prefer to hear where they are honestly wearing it and you'll still replace their sensor or do they need to tell a white lie to get their sensor replaced? <laughs> well, I think uh, often, um, you know, the, the reason for the question is, is because we can only, as a company, we're kind of legally bound. We can only speak to on-label use of the product. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's basically why we ask the question, because if it's, if it's off-label use on alternate site, um, there's not a lot we can do um, when speaking to customers about issues. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably the the safest thing I can I can say. But you're one one to say. of the things, yeah, exactly. One of the things I always I like to add too is that the the reason why the current product um, my G6 is um, indicated for abdominal use in adults and then in peds, the abdominal and buttocks mm -hmm. uh, is is really because that's where during our very large clinical studies that we have to run to show the performance of the product. Those are the sites we've chosen. Um, there's no scientific reason why it wouldn't work in other locations, but we haven't proven with a you know, FDA study that shows performance in those alternate locations. So that's really why we don't have the indication. But um, as we look towards uh, future products, that's something we've, we're always evaluating is when, when is the time to do the study that allows us to claim that it works in the arm versus some um, people using it there. And I imagine the G7 is going to offer that kind of opportunity because of the new size. So I'm just guessing out loud. But so, okay, so let's play act for a minute, Jake. You be the customer service representative. I'm like, hey, it's Scott. I'm calling because my sensor failed on the third day. And you say, where were you wearing it? And I say, uh, on my forehead. And um, does that stop now the customer service representative from answering any questions? That I understand. Does it stop them from replacing it? Uh, I don't believe it stops them from replacing it, no. But uh, um, we, can, yeah, I, I, that that I'm I'm less familiar with exactly how that works. Okay, Jake, I appreciate it. I'm sorry I put you on the spot. No worries. Now Arden always wears her on her, like her hip butt area, like like qu quite literally forever. So I never run into that. But I do understand a bit of the other side of it about the data collection and you know what what ends up happening after that. So. All right, ready? I'm going to hit you with a bunch of asks. So this is the feedback part. And then at the, right. at the end, I'm going to ask you about Apple Watch, which Kevin ran around town after ADA, uh, like, uh, like Paul Revere, talking about everywhere somebody would stop and look <laughs> at him. So we'll get to that last, but, but okay. Cool. So I have some asks of my own, and I have some asks from people. Okay, I've got my notebook up. All right, let's break it down to like, I don't know how we'll break it down. Um, all right, here's the first one. Raw data, like the uh, so there are people who use third party apps who can see what the I guess the what the algorithm's thinking. It's thinking you might be here, you might be there, or you know the, somebody will say, "Look, when my Dexcom app tells me there's no data available, I still see the data on this other thing." 
I think I know the answer to this, but is there ever thought to allowing people to see that raw data? Um, well, I'll enter in two different ways. The, the raw data, which is actually the, the sensor signal, mm-hmm. um, that is, um, we, we don't intend to, to share that um, uh, and, and display that. And the, and the, real, the reason why is um, one of the reasons why we d- can develop algorithms that ensure sensors are accurate is the volume of data that we have and our experience with the sensor manufacturing and how we pair it to the algorithm, all those things. A lot of the what, what I've seen uh, as folks trying to develop their own algorithms that use the raw data is that they have not seen all the different types of failure modes that can occur um, or things in the signal. They, they just don't have enough, you know, no, no, even if you had a number of people trying to capture that raw data, you're never going to get it to an, an algorithm that has, um, you know, seen all of the, the different things that our, our team has been able to look at over millions and millions of sensors. So um, it's just kind of a... It might be a little dangerous to do that. So I think our, our goal right now is provide reliable real-time data. One of the things we are doing, though, that's new is, um, and I spoke a little bit about it at our product theater at ADA, was that um, there's a retrospective API that's available today for um, partners who are developing apps, meaning uh, they can develop an app that then goes to our cloud and pulls down three-hour delayed data. Mm-hmm. Uh, something that we're lo- we're working with the FDA on is uh, getting a, an approval for a real time API. This would be an API that would provide real time data to uh, other apps um, through the cloud. Um, you could imagine p- uh, a partner could develop a a different type of follow app that maybe offers things different than the way that our follow app works. Um, or other there's lots of other reasons why people want real time data and not retrospective. And so I think that's going to be an exciting opportunity in in the future. Um, for uh, access to real-time data, but not raw data. If I dumped it down and said to you, it's possible I could walk outside, close my eyes, walk across the street, not get hit by a car. But if I keep doing it, eventually I might get hit by the car. Is that the idea that you can... Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. There, there are things that can happen that, um, unless you have ex- lots of experience with the often those cars drive down the street, you might time it wrong and get run over. And so somebody could be using this data that you're choosing not to show people for very good reasons. And it, while it may work out for them well today, it, it, it could end up making being a bad decision based on that data later. And, that, yeah, and that's something your exactly. algorithm would weed out and never let get to the end user. Exactly. Gotcha. Yep. All right, cool. Um, some things that have uh, that don't exist on like follow or uh, there's one little one that's amazing. And I don't, I'm, I'm love to know why I can't see rate of change on my Dexcom apps. Why can't I see that my blood sugar is 160 and that means it's gone down, I don't know, three points since the last reading. Oh, um, so, so the, so the arrows, uh, indicate a rate of change, but you're saying like an actual number, show the number. I have to say it's on a couple of third party apps that I've seen and it's incredibly valuable. Like, like I, I was, so I was saying something to somebody this morning that is, is in the same vein, but different. So she's using, um, this woman I'm talking to, uh, hi Brandy is, um, has her low set at a hundred. But she really doesn't think of herself as, you know, needing to do something till after 80. But when she gets under 100, her line turns red and it changes how she feels about it. The, and so the, right. the line itself doesn't scare her. Where it's at doesn't scare her. But the, the, the color of it makes her brain think differently. So I said to her, just push it down to 80 so that you don't see red. And believe it or not, Jake, and I'm sure you do believe it, that, that impacts how you think about what's going on. Sometimes it, it, it takes away anxiety, right? Like I see a falling line, but it's not red. So I feel better about it. The rate of change on other apps. I have a secondary app running behind Arden's Dexcom app. And when I look at it and it says, you know, uh, I hear, Oh, she's falling. And I look, but I see she's only fallen a little bit. Like it gives me more perspective. Rate of change would be an amazing update to your stuff. I think a plus or minus and a number. Cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, um, I'll I'm add, I just added it to to our list. Um, I do. We do really um, identify with that that concept of there's a, can be an emotional reaction to the way things are displayed mm-hmm. uh, in the colors, and and that is um, one of the things that we fact, factored into some of the G original G5 and the Mag Glass design, but um, things that we're also looking at for our, our next iteration of the app. Um, because you, you're absolutely right. There there is. A rea- it can be a reaction um, 
to how you feel about the way the information is displayed. And, and building on that, I have a question I'm going to ask. I don't know the answer to, but I might bet a little bit of money on it. The last update to the follow app, have you, yeah. ch- have you changed how the line is rendered? And I don't know if I, I don't even know if I'm using the right words, like, but does the, do the angles and the pitch of the lines in that, in when I look at that, that follow app, have they been squeezed or stretched somehow? Because I make so many, I manage Arden based on so many inferments on pitch of the line, which I know is probably yeah. a little above, you know, how some people think about it, but I'm <laughs> going to, I'm going to pull it out now so that I can, so I can talk about it a little more thoughtfully. It's a bit, that's definitely advanced. And, uh, and, but, using, yeah. but has that changed in the last update? And maybe you don't even know, like it could have literally been something a graphics person did just because it looked nicer, but it changed my interpretation of the data. The, um, what, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give a cu- couple differences. So the, um, uh, you know, with the new updates to follow, um, there's the, we, it, it, we introduced the landscape mode, which allows you to turn the phone sideways and then you can use your finger and you can actually trace along and see the, the points and, and what's displayed. Right. Um, and what is, um, there were some enhancements that basically makes the display on follow the same as the display that's on the G6 app. Okay. Um, so it, the the older version of Follow had a, an older version of that graph display, mm-hmm. and so um, there may be um, as you look at it, you may see it slightly different than the uh, the new one versus the old one. But the the new Follow is uh, identical to what's on the G6 app when it comes to the way those points are displayed. Yeah. It's actually the same physical code. You might want to add me to your beta tester list is all I'm saying, because as this podcaster get this podcast gets, we're about to, by the way, this summer we'll celebrate a million downloads. So, um, as that's happening, I'm actually seeing almost to my uh, um, amazement that the ideas we talk about here are, I think it's become a way of thinking. And so if it happened to me, it happened to other people and it, it, it genuinely was, it was off putting. Like I looked and I, I was like, Oh, now I can't decide what to do. Just because it visually okay. looked different, which was just anyway. And again, that might be a ninja level problem, but um, but it was it was real. Yeah, that's no, real, definitely. Can followers please see expiration times of sensors on the follow app? We um, yes, absolutely. That is uh, we we want. There's a number of like there's extra information that we need to provide in the follow app um, because it's really around this concept of. Your, you know, parents are helping uh, their, their children manage um, diabetes, and the more information we can put into that, the better. I'll give you an example. Um, at one point, we were thinking, okay, maybe we just take all of the um, clarity features and put them into the G6 app. But what, in thinking through that, what we realized was there's a lot of parents who use the follow app that don't themselves have a G6 app. They're, they have a follow app, and they use the clarity app as well. And so... That clarity app is an important aspect of um, it being separate from the CGM app. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, th- we definitely recognize it's a very important use case, and there's a lot of information that we want to uh, update in the follow app. Um, one of the things we did recently is there's now insulin data in clarity for the first time ever uh, using, uh, if, if uh, patients are using an in pen from Companion Medical, um, uh, that's a, a smart pen that has its own app. And that data is being automatically uploaded to the Clarity accounts. I would love to show that in follow, um, show that insulin data in follow. And we'll, we'll add, over time, we'll add more of our insulin partners. We'll display insulin data from their delivery systems, pumps and pens in our um, Clarity software. Uh, and so that, that's another example of just the richness of the data we can provide inside, uh, inside the apps. Um, and yeah, expiration date. Definitely. Okay. Jake, you just answered a private question I've had that I've never asked anyone. I've always wondered, like, I wonder if Dexcom's pissed that Mike left it and started up in pen, but now I realize you're not. So <laughs> not, not at all. Not at all. No, I'm, I'm, uh, Mike and I are good friends and, um, I, I, yeah, they're, they're doing great things over there and, um, they were, we're happy to be working with them. It's very nice to know that you are uplifting of people who, uh, who move on. I actually, a person who helps me with the business side of this podcast with you guys, she's going back to school. Melissa, I want to wish you a ton of luck and success. It's very cool to know that you're not pissed at her now that she's going. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Okay. So people ask all the time, more volume and alarm control, like, like functionality, user defined, not just 
the timing of it, but the volume of it. One lady said, I, I wish I had her. Um, she's like, it would be fantastic. Oh, if the high alarm could go off um, at night and wake me up, but not scare everyone I'm around during the day. That's how she put it. That was, I thought, um, appropriate. Because I see my daughter sometimes grab her phone and clutch it to her when her alarm goes off, trying to quiet it down a little bit. Um, right. But yeah, we, yeah. So adding a, a volume to like the, the times um, a day. The profile, yeah. Yep, yep, yeah. Um, Times a day, yep. So here's one for you. You talked about how there's the landscape view now on the follow-up, which I really like, and you can run your finger along all that. But when you guys did that, you took away the 3, 6, 12, and 24 options on the portrait view. That's made a lot of people unhappy. I'm one of them, actually. Yeah, and is that because you have to turn it sideways to be able to get to it? Yeah, it's, so it's kind of an yeah, extra step. And I, I'm, I can speak for myself. I don't know why other people do it, but... I can make better treatment decisions on a three hour line than I can on a six hour line. I look at a 24 hour line for trends. I look at a 12 hour line to see if my boluses are off. So the, 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 um, the ability to step back, like, you know, the idea of like, you know, when your hand's right in front of your face, you can't see much, but you step back a little bit. I, sometimes I need my hand in front of my face and sometimes I need to be able to step back. But when you go to landscape mode, you can select the three-hour display, right? Yes, but there's something about it that irritates me that I have to do that. And I couldn't even, I can't, uh, quanti okay. I can't quantify that for you, but so many people say it that I don't think I'm the only one. Yeah, no, it's definitely, it, it was a big change here, right? And I also imagine it, you thought, here's me, I'm, I'm putting myself in your head, I'm in the meeting and I go, yeah, it'll be on the landscape side, it's fine. And that's probably made sense, but it, it, it wasn't just... How do I put this? I thought when it first changed, oh, I'll get used to it, and I never have. That that yeah. I that I think is the important part. That's good feedback. Yeah, yeah. Will will we ever get an app for follow? Will there be a uh, excuse me a widget for follow? Yes, yeah, absolutely. That's that's on that's on the list for sure. Um, uh, that's uh, yeah, it's a tie on the list for follow. All right. Here's a, a when will follow have the features that users can see? See this? Somebody just asked it in a great like one liner, like all the stuff we've been going over. So just, I wanted to just share that with you. It came back so much. It's somebody just said, look, I see all these people have asked these great questions here. I don't know if my question's in here. So I just want to know when will the features be there for follow and what will they be? And, um, and so I'm wondering, as I'm asking you the questions, are you hearing me going, Ooh, that's definitely coming soon. Or, Oh, that's a good idea. Are, are you having both reactions to I mean, yeah, both both reactions. I think mo most of the stuff we talk about is on is on the list to do, and and the way we what we do is we manage. We we in software development we call it a backlog. You have all these requests uh, of things you want to implement, and we go through and prioritize um, using mainly customer feedback, um, but also kind of level of effort. Some features are really easy to implement that take and have a big impact. Some features are um, harder to implement and um, may have a big impact, but they kind of take longer. So we try and group a number of those together. Um, one of the things that we're looking at doing right now is um, being able to um, re make releases faster. So we've, you know, with the uh, classification of um, G6 moving to a class two from a class three, um, it's enabled a lot of us, our systems to be able to be updated so that we can do things a little faster. Um, it doesn't change kind of the validation requirements or any of the quality, but it just allows us to put things out faster without having to always put it in front of the FDA before you know, before putting it into the market. So we're in the, in the midst of planning out how can we move faster. Um, and so there'll be updates coming out um, more frequently than we have in the past, particularly for Follow. Follow really hadn't been updated much since the original version was launched with G4. We, we've done a lot of compatibility updates, but not new features. And so we're just beginning to start you know, planning out, okay, what are all these new features? We've got a great list, um, and many of the things that we've talked about, most of the things you and I have talked about um, are on that list. But um, so the timing is, is going to be definitely be within the G6 timeframe. So within the next year, you know, year or so, there'll be a number of new releases for follow. But we just did our first big one, and we learned you know, we learned some things. Um, uh, not everything went perfect with that, that launch, and we, we recognize that. And so we're looking at, okay, how can we do it better in the future? The exciting thing, though, is that it's going to become faster and faster for us to be releases. It's also worth noting, like, sure, there are, like, third-party apps that people are like, oh, look, it has, like, rate of change is a good example. This one has rate of change. This one's better. Why doesn't Dexcom do that? But 
I would also tell those people who like those apps, those apps are incredibly confusing and overwhelming. And only the people who really understand all of that can look at that and not become confused and overwhelmed by it. I think they have to accept that there is always going to be something from the company that's for everyone and that there might be other avenues. And you spoke about it before you said there'll be an API available where people will be able to make a different app. Like there's, they have to understand your Dexcom for everybody there. You know, and I think that way too, because there's some third party apps that people love and I look at them and I'm like, Oh my God, that is garbage. And I could never use that, but people love it. It's just, it's too much. And I don't think I'm easily overwhelmed by the data coming back from Arden CGM. And sometimes I'm like, that's too much. I have one here for you, Jake. I, I, but when I saw people uh, ask, I thought, oh my God, that's the completion of my thought. Because sometimes when you get away from, you know, like say you go in the pool and so there's no, se- there's no, you know, you can't get a signal and your kid's been swimming for 20 or 30 minutes. You think, oh, I really would like to know what their blood sugar is. And then they jump out and then you have to wait for a cycle before you get a number back again. Could you use a, f- could there be a button that forces an update? Let's go with this Scott types into his browser thing one more time. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Boom. Make knowledge your superpower with the Dexcom G6 CGM system. I think your superpower is that you live. I think your superpower is that you listen to the juice box podcast, but we'll make this your second superpower. Okay. Zero. Let's see. What does this say here? Zero finger sticks, glucose readings right on your smart device, customizable alerts, alarms. Get started with Dexcom. Click patient name. First name, last name, email address, phone number, city, zip code, birth date, type of diabetes. Do you pump? Do you use pills? Do you use injections? Insurance information. I agree. I agree. I'm not a robot. And next. Wow, look at this. Thank you for your submission. You are one step closer to obtaining a Dexcom continuous glucose monitoring system. One of our representatives will be reaching out out to you to take the next step. Hmm. And you know what the next step is, don't you? No more finger sticks. Seeing what direction your blood sugar is moving and how fast it's going there. Being able to follow a loved one's blood sugar no matter where they are on your iPhone or Android. Hmm. That's the next step, baby. The next step is the stuff you hear us talking about on this podcast every day. The next step is freedom. It's ease. It's happy. Take a happy step. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box with links in your show notes or at juiceboxpodcast.com. All right, let's find out about this Apple Watch thing, shall we? Could there be a button that forces an update? Right now, so the, the way that the system is architected, um, it's the transmitter that turns on and um, tries to make a connection with the displays that are within range. Okay. And today, because of a battery and the technology kind of constraints, it only does that every five minutes. But um, there's lots of uh, concepts that we've been mulling over for our G7 system that could potentially make that update quicker because we totally recognize the, hey, I want an update now, um, and uh, you know, I might have to wait up to five minutes to get, get the update. So, um, yeah, there's, yeah, I think our, our approach to that would be, um, more, more faster updates, um, uh, between the two devices, not just every five minutes like there is today. So maybe when there's a battery situation that can handle it, you'll be able to ping more because I, I saw both sides of it. I thought that's a really brilliant idea. And then I also thought, oh my God, some type a loon is going to stand there and push that button over and over again and kill the battery in the transmitter. And, and so yeah. Yeah, <laughs> just be like, what is it now? What is it now? Like, okay, relax. But, but I think this question comes specifically from parents because I've had the same thought. Like when you have to stop your kid's life and tell them, Hey, stand here. It's, it's a little, you know what? It's weird, but it's a little demeaning. I don't know another way to put it like, Hey, stand here till this thing tells me this number. So you can go back on the field or go back in the pool or something like that. In that specific context, it makes a ton of sense to me. It's the only other time I've ever considered it. I mean, maybe like when you're battling a low sometimes and you, you eat something, you're like, God, I wish I knew what it was right now. But you just usually test in that situation. But that's good to know. So it's, it's all right. So it's something on your radar. Um, do we yeah. have time? Can I hammer you with a couple quick ones and let you and then go to Apple Watch? Yeah. 
an option for a snooze alarm was asked a bunch of times. Like, hey, I have it set up so that I repeat every five minutes because I want that, but so that I hear and I know. But once I know, I know. Is there a way I could tell it, all right, right on, don't tell me five minutes from now again? I have that problem sometimes with high blood sugars. Like, I want to yes, know what, absolutely. you know what I mean? So is snooze in the works? Got it. Yes, yeah. Actually, there's a number of things about... It's actually great you mentioned the high. There's just a number of things about the high high alert and the intelligence of the alerts that we're working on. I think one of the things that I always think about is, you know, sometimes people want to be alerted when they're going high. Sometimes people know they're going to go high and they don't necessarily want the alert, um, uh, at least not within a period of time. So some sort of flexibility there. There's definitely, we're trying to design, uh, you know, for, uh, again, like you mentioned, uh, apps that can work for lots of different people. So um, we're looking at how do you turn features like that on for people who want them. Um, And so I think that uh, the intelligence around the alerts, the snooze, all of those things are are definitely on the on the horizon. Yeah, I I know I mentioned this to you in the past, but I think it, it bears repeating again here. Photoshop Elements has tabs at the top. You can you can use it in expert or you can use it in beginner. In beginner it's paint you know, it's like Paint Shop Pro from like thirty years ago. And in expert yep. it has more options. And I just I think that's yep. a simple way to, around uh fall alerts for followers that people say is really desperately needed. Like it's not enough to see the number going down. Like they want to be alerted if they're falling faster or not. Okay. Uh just let's see what on thresholds can be said the right times a day. Oh this one comes up a lot. Is there, um, I don't know, how did she put it? Profile options. Like, can I set up a profile that works for the school nurse, but is different from me? Because I don't want the school or nurse, like for, for follow. follow. Yeah. Like, I don't want the school nurse knowing what my kid's blood sugar is after five o'clock in the afternoon, that kind of thing. Oh, okay. So by time of day. Okay. Yeah. And, and yeah. by person. Like, so can that person have access to this data, but only in this time of, you know, and on these certain days, or can I stop them from seeing it without making, forcing, like unfollowing, like dropping them from the follower list? Yes, we could, we could do some, that's a, that's a, um, uh, not, I've heard that a a request, a similar type of request, not in the same uh, way, but I think, uh, yeah, that's definitely something that could be implemented. Um, I think you can have different settings for different followers, but what we don't have is the ability to turn off follow like on the weekend for the exact use case, the nurse you're talking about. Yeah. Um, that was not the original use case when we designed the follow system was not for that, but we've learned over time. There's a lot of different uses for follow that we didn't originally design for that we need to consider. And so that's, that's an important one. Adding when we added up to 10 followers yeah. um, just recently, that was really born out of people were having to add followers and remove followers every week because there were more than five that needed at a given time. So um, this is like an enhancement to that. It's okay. Now that you have up to 10, let's figure out when we can turn them on and off based on our profile. Yeah. I yeah, like that. That's a great idea. Uh, and I think in a similar, uh, a slightly similar vein, someone said, Hey, my son's user app has different thresholds that can be set for different times a day, but can I do that on my follow app too? Yeah, I guess that's a person saying, you know, maybe they're saying, look, I'm comfortable with my kid's blood sugar being 150 while they're sleeping. But during the day, I want to know when it's over 130 or something like that. So I don't want to get woken up. Like, I want to be able to say not now, then on the follow side as well. And I guess exactly. you could use that yep. the an opposite way. I'd like to know, you know, I want to know what I want to know when I want to know it, I guess is the is the crux of it. Okay. So one quick question, and then I want to, I'm just going to say Apple watch and let you talk. Um, (laughs) somebody pointed out that there's some, seems to be a lag to the health app. And I don't think a ton of people use the health app, but I think you would like them to. And I use it sometimes. Is there a reason why the information's not live on the health app? Is that an Apple thing? So it's, yeah, uh, that's a great question. There's the health app on, um, the Apple, um, uh, platform and then on Google we actually have Google Fit, um, which is also um, the same type of a database where users, if they um, activate it, can it'll deposit their their CGM information in there. It is three. It is delayed. It's three hours delayed. It's what is in, in called retrospective, um, and that is really um, because of the um, uh, the FDA kind of regulation around real time data. Um, in, in real-time data is a different classification in terms of risk than the um, retrospective data. Retrospective data is considered data that you can't utilize to manage your diabetes in real time. 
says it's three hours old, insulin action times and all the things factored in. You can't really use three hour old data to manage diabetes in real time. So um, that is something that we're looking at revisiting. Um, but right now that it is delayed three hours and it's because of the, the way that we got that cleared with the FDA. If, if you think about it, it's, very, it's the exact same uh, delay that's in our current retrospective API where we share data with uh, like Gluco and others. Um, that's all three hour delayed um, for the same type of a reason. But we're engaged with the FDA right now in conversations about how do we open up real time data more, um, uh, make it more available to partners. Yeah. Um, and health is, is uh, Apple Health is one of those things where it's a database. Users can use it to share their uh, CGM data with other apps on the phone that they select. Mm-hmm. And so we're looking at all the different options there. It's cool that people are using it, that's for sure. Hey, listen, before I say Apple Watch to you, I want to tell you, I got this feedback from somebody recently and you you talk you guys have been talking a lot more about partnerships obviously in the last years or so you have one with tidepool and omnipod and t slim and i'm sure like others and um and it, it it's it's really moving people forward quickly and even though you you know dexcom and this podcast aren't partners um having access to your to your brain and being able to pick your brain like this and having access to the data that comes back from my daughter's glucose monitor has sort of turned this podcast into that thing. Like when I recognized that there were people saying that they managed their diabetes um, and they were talking about it like they were being bold with insulin. I was like, well, that's something we said on the podcast years ago. And it's become a hashtag that's growing. And I, what I didn't realize is that people think of that as a management style now. And I would never have come up with it without the data that you guys share with me from my daughter. Um, so in some fairly strange way, you, you know, there are now, I'm going to say, cause I want to be conservative, but I, I pretty sure I hear from a dozen people a day, a dozen different people every day who are showing me either they figured out a meal or their a one C's down one, two, two and a half points. People that once they've listened to the podcast for a while, just get six a one C's in the sixes, like just, it just happens now. They don't even stress about it. It's just they do these things. These things turn into an A1C that's, you know, more like six. So I have to thank you. I mean, my daughter's health aside, I'm a little overwhelmed by how many people it's reaching. So it it really is. It means a lot to me. And from what I'm hearing back from all these people, it means a lot from them, too, because every one of these questions ends with please thank them. You know, I, uh, yeah, we, we really appreciate it. And our, our, our teams, you know, one of the the great things about working at Dexcom is we we get a lot of feedback, um, you know, both positive and constructive. But when when people talk about how the product is help them, uh, you know, change their lives or help them, you know, manage their diabetes better or save their child's life. But last night, it's one of the things I love to share with our teams because they, I mean, it just helps drive their motivation and passion for what they're doing. Yeah, and it is um, we we are, our company culture is give us motto patient first which is you, you do um, every, right by the patient and everything kind of else takes care of itself. So that is um, core to our uh, DNA and it's going to remain part, part of what we do forever. Well, share this one next time. I met a person in their late 40s who's had diabetes for all of their adult life and their blood sugars are constantly all over the place. A1Cs are constantly in the 8s and the 9s. And just by looking at a graph from a Dexcom, receiver. I was able to tell them, okay, here's what's wrong with your basal insulin. Here's where your, you know, your boluses are wrong. We have to change your insulin to carb ratio, blah, blah, blah. So decades of living like that. And three days after we talked, they're fine. Blood sugar, never under 80, never over 120. They know how to do it now. It was all there the whole time. They just didn't know how to interpret it. Yeah. It's it's fascinating. It's data that it's data that people haven't, you know, in, in the past, you didn't have access to that type of information. Now that it's there, there's so much can be done with it. And there's so much more we can do with it. So, yeah, Jake, lots it's, of excitement. It, and it doesn't even take long. Like, I am at the point now where I can look at a graph and be like, oh, I know what's wrong, like immediately. And I, trust me, you don't know me that well. Uh, that I'm the guy that has that skill is bizarre because it shouldn't be me. Like I'm really the guy you should be like, Hey, Oh Scott. Yeah. We go to the movies with him. He's nice. Like that's pretty much it. Like that, that I've developed any kind of a skill is crazy. So if I can interpret that data back, I can't imagine what it's doing even for the people that I don't know. So, okay, Jake, um, 8 million, 14,000 
253 people asked me when they can use their Apple Watch without a receiver or their iPhone. So uh, when's that happening? Okay. <laughs> yes. Trust me, it is coming. Yes. I, you know, uh, you know, we were doing some, uh, we have some prototypes uh, that um, we've uh, built and been testing quite, quite heavily. And so um, we're, uh, a couple things about it. It uh, requires an update to our transmitter firmware. So it's kind of invisible to users, but um, there'll be a firmware that's going an update. That's the software inside the transmitter. Um, there's some new features we had to add to the Bluetooth interface to enable the smooth handoff between when the user is, their phone is in range and they're using their phone. And then when they walk away from their phone and they want their watch to take over, um, we had to make some um, rather significant changes to the Bluetooth interface to do that, uh, working uh, with the uh, Apple profile for the watch. And so uh, we've made those changes uh, and we've got systems that we've been testing for quite a while um, to ensure that this thing works exactly the way we want it to. Um, but it'll we'll, we'll begin shipping transmitters with that firmware in it soon. I can't be spe- exactly specific, but we'll ship it. And then as soon as enough of those transmitters are out there, um, we'll turn on the app feature uh, that allows it to hap- uh, allows it to, the transmitter to communicate directly with the watch. A um, couple things about it, though. You'll, you'll always need to have an iPhone to kind of set up and start the session um, because there's a lot of functionality in the app that is um, we can't implement all of that on the watch. But once you have the session up and running, then you can walk away from your phone for extended periods of time and you'll, you'll get your alerts and you'll get all your CGM data live. Um, I've been testing the feature myself. Um, it's, it's incredible. You know, I don't have diabetes, but I'm always testing our products and understanding from user perspective. But it's um, wildly freeing to know I can just walk away from the phone and still get my readings on, my, on the watch um, without having to um, kind of oh, wait, I got to go back in range. It's kind of like that concept you're mentioning about having the child stand next to you for at least five minutes to get their data. Well, this is one of those, if they're wearing the watch, um, in all likelihood, there's going to be uh, data on it. So there's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really exciting feature. It's it's more impactful than I even thought it was going to be when I, before I started testing it. So it will it will come out. It will come out on G6. Um, and uh, that's about as much as I can say on timing. But um, well, it's, uh, it's coming the way Kevin said it was. And cause I, I said to him, I was like, look, you should just not mention it until it's, you know, in everyone's hands, then turn it on and be like, Hey, guess what you guys have now. <laughs> but let me ask you a question about, about that, about setting expectations for people. And then I'm going to let you go because we've been talking about Apple watch and, and this, this usability, it feels like for a really long time. And while most people aren't in the space enough in their day-to-day lives to feel like, Oh God, they told me that two years ago. I don't believe it anymore. I have heard that from people who are constantly in the diabetes space. So my question is, is it, did you guys start talking about it? Cause nothing happens by mistake in a company. You're a publicly traded company. So did you start talking about it by, and think it was going to go faster? Did somebody else that was the Apple side that held it up or were you just like, hey, this thing's coming, but you don't think of time the same way as maybe the people who are waiting for it? Like, I know there's a lot of questions in there, but I'd love to understand that whole, like, when we hear about something and, you know, when uh, to when we get it, like, what's the thought process on the back end with you guys? Like, does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, that's a great, it's a great question. Yeah. Um, the, so um, the, the, the short answer is we, we in, thought it was going to go faster. Um, so we usually don't. Like G7, right? We've talked about that for quite a while. Um, part of that's because it, it revolved around a partnership with Verily, um, and we um, kind of there was a large financial commitment made to in that partnership. So you kind of talk about what are you doing? Well, it's for our G7 platform. Um, but the Apple Watch specifically is about. Um, we thought it was going to go faster, and what happened was um, Apple turned on the core Bluetooth functionality for certain partners, Dexcom being one of them. That's the ability to actually connect directly to the watch with the Bluetooth interface. And as we started to go through our use case with the version that they first implemented, um, it was about two years ago, I think they announced it. Um, we started to realize that um, the use case wasn't going to work. One of the specific things was pairing our transmitter to the watch was a challenge with the original implementation of how that core functionality worked on the watch. And so, you know, giving, you know, working with Apple feedback, um, we're also not the only uh, folks uh, working with Apple on connectivity to the watch. There's other um, types of devices out there that are doing it. So all of us working together, 
basically had to we had to iterate um, the implementation. And so the new Watch OS um, that was um, launched at the end of last year has the functionality in it that we need to make the user experience what we wanted. And so since that release, we've been doing a lot of testing to ensure it covered all the use cases. But what we didn't want to do was launch it and have it not kind of not delight users and have some issues on the usability side. So we've actually had prototypes since for multiple years that have been have the functionality, but they didn't work smoothly. Um, there'd be data gaps, there'd be things that happened. So it's taken us this time uh, and the updates from Apple to make it work properly. So that's that kind of a long answer, but we thought it was going to go faster. This particular one. I'm an Apple Watch user, and every time I buy a new one, I think to myself, why am I buying another one of these things? And I, there's part of me that's like, it's because it's going to start working the way I want it to soon. <laughs> And, and yeah, it, it is really new technology. Listen, it's easy to joke about. There's a tiny little thing on your wrist that's a computer that, you know, probably could could launch the space shuttle. And if we had a space shuttle anymore, and boy, that was an old reference. And it's just this, <laughs> this stuff takes time to develop. And there's so many different partners and people trying to use it. Like, it all makes sense to me, but it's easy in the moment to think, to, to feel. Like, as I felt it too, like, oh, they said Apple Watch and now... You know, I, I think I'm two more Apple Watches into it. And, but you're saying now everything is sort of finally there. Like, you're comfortable that when this comes out, it is going to be the thing that people wanted. Yes. Yeah, that's excellent. Hey, um, I'll, I'm going to let you go, but I, I don't know anything about Android, but I got a lot of messages that just said Galaxy S10. Is that a thing? Do you, is yeah, it not so, working right um, now? Well, no, it's, it's not, well, it's not that it doesn't work, but the Samsung S10 is a new phone from, uh, from Samsung, the Galaxy S10. And um, it just launched at the beginning of the year. And uh, we're currently testing compatibility for it. Um, one of the things that happens with our current testing, particularly for Android, because Android devices, there's more of them, and they release at different cycles. Um, we have to do uh, quite a bit of compatibility testing to be able to add it to our list of um, compatible devices on the website. There's um, Right now, um, there's over 40 devices on our website that the G6 and G5 are compatible with. Uh, you know, cell phones, but um, the Samsung one is that we just finished the testing. So within the next month or so, um, it should be um, on the supported device list. And so we're working hard to um, bring that, but it does take us about three months to get through all of the testing um, that's required. One of the things we are looking at and working with the FDA on is there, now that we've had a lot of experience with this um, compatibility testing, is there a way to do this faster? Because we think, um, there's probably some things that are, we've been doing that we could um, go faster or reduce that amount of testing. But it is important, and it's important to the FDA that the device work well and that they're very compatible. And um, there are some Android devices out there. They tend to be the lower cost devices that don't work as well, and we don't support them for that reason because the, the Bluetooth compatibility is not as strong as it needs to be. So that's what we're validating with the S10. So hopefully. Um, I, I, even by, by the end of this month, which is like there it is, a week away, I think that we should have it up by then. But I was just actually looking at that um, the other day. So very soon the S10 will be supported. Cool. Hey, so other 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 watches that I have an Apple Watch, so I'm American. I just imagine nothing else exists. And so are there other like watches and devices that are you guys looking at having the ability to do it on Fitbit or like I'm just making up words now? But other th are there other things like that that exist? So are you just, as far as a watch goes, is it just going to be Apple Watch in the near future? Uh, on the Android platform today, we support the secondary display on, on the Wear um, iOS system. So the, a lot of different manufacturers um, manufacture um, uh, watches that are compatible with um, Wear OS. And so that we do that secondary display, and we are looking at um, doing a direct uh, to watch on some other some of the other platforms as well, um, but uh, Apple is going to be the first. Okay. Hey, and my last thought because I just had it now. Hey Siri for followers. Is that it? Yeah, a... yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely on the list. Cool. Yep. Because people like yep, it. Yep. it, and I hear a lot from people like when I'm driving. Hey Siri is a big help to me. Now I've said Hey Siri three times. My phone's going to start yelling at me soon. But um, cool, Jake. I kept you like for the whole hour. This thing is packed with information. I really appreciate you coming on and doing this. I'm going to say goodbye. And thank you to Dexcom, Omnipod, and Dancing for Diabetes for sponsoring this episode of the Juicebox Podcast. Please don't forget that there are links in your show notes and at juiceboxpodcast.com if you want to find out more about the sponsors. 
If you downloaded this on Friday or the weekend, I hope you enjoyed getting an extra episode of the podcast this week. Please don't forget that Defining Diabetes also came out on Friday along with this episode. Defining Diabetes, of course, is with Jenny Smith and I, where we take a term from your diabetes life and define it in just a few short minutes. Jake came back, back again. Yes, he's back, back again. Jake came back, Jake came back, Jake came back, Jake came back. Ah.